you've probably seen this chart here. Today we're going to be doing a quick response to a Marxist analysis of 21st, 20th century U.S. capitalism. So this is a chart produced by e the API uh, Economic Policy Institute, which is a left-leaning think tank. We try to claim basically that wages of goods producing workers hasn't tracked with productivity. So the red line is wages of production non-supervisory employees. So anybody can make a graph. And it's important to, anytime you hear a claim made, to critically analyze it and to go to other sources and see if they, they have the same information. So here's a National Bureau of Economic Research working paper, and they say, total employee compensation as a share of national income was 66% of national income in 1970 and 64% in 2006. This is also why I don't believe that it's a huge problem that some people earn their money off of capital, off of ownership of capital goods, you know, generational wealth, that sort of thing, because two thirds of the shares, two thirds of the share of national income goes to workers. Well, national income is pretty big. It's like $28 trillion. So that's $19 trillion in salaries. You know, it's true that, you know, billionaires and, and really rich millionaires uh, are always going to keep getting richer because their money's working for them. But when you look at how much wealth is created every year, uh, it seems to me the workers are getting at least their fair share. One of the tenets of Marxism is that in order to continually make profits, um, employee uh, the capitalists need to extract more surplus value from workers. So that's why this graph is very attractive to them because it, it shows or purports to show basically that the capitalist class is getting richer and wages for ordinary workers are stagnating. That's what Marxism predicts, but that's not what the data demonstrates. Now, let's dig into this a little more. So here we've got essentially the same graph uh, starting in 1970, but you see the same same curve. Well, the first thing is that we have production worker hourly wages here, where uh, and and that's the the same thing as wages of goods producing workers, which was shown on the other graph. So it's not the entire labor force; it's a subset of the labor force known as production non supervisory, which is uh, the least educated uh, of the different cohorts or groups of workers. So if you looked at, say, hourly wages for all workers, you notice we're getting much closer to gross output per hour. And now, if you see the purple line, that's hourly compensation for all workers, because wages uh, is not the only form of compensation, especially in the United States, where a lot of people's health care is tied to their employer. So benefits uh, come at the expense of wages, and a job with good benefits should be evaluated as having a higher wage or more compensation than a job with no benefits and a similar hourly. So that is, you have to look at total comp. Finally, uh, there's some questions as to, because you see this, this graph occurs over time, 1969 to 2013. So every year there's inflation because the government's creating new money or, or banks are creating new money. And um, 
that has to be accounted for when you're doing uh, a study over time. So if you use a different deflator, you come up with this purple line here, which is very close to the green line. So I hope you can see how misleading uh, a lot of information can be, especially when it's presented in a very biased or unscientific manner. While the red line over here represents worker compensation or the total value of wages received by workers in those industries. Well, does it refer to compensation or does it refer to wages? These are not the same thing. The purpose of showing these two trends side by side is to take note of the relationship between them. We can see that from 1945 to approximately 1970, the growth between total value output and wages remained constant. As workers produced more value output, they received a proportionate increase in compensation. Leftists love to claim like during the 80s, neoliberalism struck and then everything changed and things got worse. There you go again. So completely uh, out of touch with reality. We also see at the beginning of the 1970s, this trend came to a gradual halt as wages began to stagnate. This trend continued for 50 years and today in 2023, wages remain at the levels they were at in the 1970s. Completely false. So here are uh, wages, real wages, that's adjusted for inflation for people who are 16 years and older. Uh, there's, there's certainly been periods of stagnation, but overall you have a pretty clear trend onwards and upwards. Now, the wage growth is a little anemic, Part of that's explained by increases in uh, other forms of compensation, as I said before, like healthcare coverage. This is this is uh, wages specifically. It really depends where you start from. You can start from the beginning. I think it makes more sense to start from 315, 310, as that was. Um, Basically, the wage throughout much of the 80s, I guess you had a recession there, brought the wages down a bit. Uh, the shaded lines are recession. But it seems like like wages were, throughout the 80s and 90s, at that 300 level. Um, and now they're, they're about 20% higher, sort of on average, uh, excluding the, the absolute tops there. Now, 20% wage growth over 40 years is not a lot. Uh, and there's some reasons for that. In particular, uh, high levels of inflation, discouraged savings. Um, so if people don't save money, then less money gets reinvested in the economy. Uh, you're basically relying on businesses to do it all. Uh, the other thing is high taxes, regulation, all these things slow down economic growth and depress wages. So wages definitely haven't been rising as fast as they should uh, because of government policy, but they have actually been rising. And keep it in, in, in mind that this is adjusted for inflation. So nominal wages have rose significantly. Uh, even if real purchasing power has only increased modestly. What would happen, they wondered, if millions of unemployed Western workers began to occupy their spare time learning about the 100% employment rate under Soviet communism? Two individuals within the bourgeois class that diligently worked to prevent this from happening were the US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the British economist John Maynard Keynes. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, was elected U.S. President in 1932 on the promise of offering a new deal to the American working class. Amer no, he wasn't. I mean, he was elected in 1932, but he didn't campaign on the New Deal. FDR actually attacked Hoover's 
profligate government spending and promised fiscal restraint and austerity if he was elected. Here's, here's uh, FDR's own words for campaign stuff in Iowa. I accuse the present administration of being the greatest spending administration in peacetime in all our history. It is an administration that has piled bureau on bureau, commission on commission, and has failed to anticipate the dire needs and the reduced earning power of the people. Bureaus and bureaucrats, commissions and commissioners have been retained at the expense of the taxpayer. You now, I read in the past few days in the newspapers that the president is at work on a plan to consolidate and simplify the federal bureaucracy. My friends, four long years ago in the campaign of 1928, he, as a candidate, proposed to do this same thing. And today, once more, a candidate, he is still proposing, and I leave you to draw your own inferences. And on my part, I ask you very simple to assign me the task of reducing the annual operating expenses of your national government. 1932 FDR sounds pretty based. I might have voted for him. Of course, as so often the case with politicians, they say one thing and they do the opposite. It is important to understand, too, that Hoover did not was not an, an adherent to laissez-faire. He actually instituted most of the great the New Deal's policies that were simply expanded upon by FDR. One thing that FDR did campaign on was the repeal of alcohol prohibition. It was largely inspired by the British economist John Maynard Keynes, who, like FDR, was a capitalist that wanted to save capital. FDR wasn't influenced by Keynes. Keynes wasn't really known in America until General Theory was published in, in 1936. Rexford Pugwell, who was a member of FDR's team of economic advisors, denies that Keynes had any influence over the program of the New Deal. Another New Dealer, Leon Kaysleering, uh, wrote in 1972, With all due respect to Keynes, I have been unable to discover much reasonable evidence that the New Deal would have been greatly different if he had never lived, and if the so-called school of economics had not taken on his name. Keynes was, of course, very influential over uh, policy, or Keynes and his ideas were very influential over policy throughout the 20th century. There's no question about that, but it's just inaccurate to say that um, FDR was influenced by Keynes. Just not true. In fact, the origin of a lot of the New Deal policies really began in the in the 1920s. There was a brief recession there when Harding was president, and one of the men in Harding's administration was Hoover. And Hoover was was advocating for a lot of programs that never actually came to fruition, at least not until 1929. But the idea was was sort of imp implemented or, or uh, incepted, thought of during the 1920 recession. Aside from Felix Frankfurter, there's really no evidence that any of FDR's close advisors uh, had, had even heard of Keynes, or or at least were greatly influenced by his economic thought. Keynes opposed the laissez-faire approach of his Austrian colleagues, who took a supply-side approach to economic questions, by arguing their position from the perspective of sellers. Keynes, however, advocated for a mode of economic governance that held greater concern for the purchasing power of workers as a means of keeping the cycle of production and consumption in motion. Keynes understood the necessity of supply-side economics, but also pointed out the dependency that supply has on demand. He argued that without a growing demand for consumer goods, supply would eventually seize up and the economy would re-enter a crisis. That's actually not possible because of Say's law, which is that supply of X constitutes demand for Y. To understand why, imagine a modern shipping vessel, complete with cargo for trade, arrived at a port in America 
in the 1300s, what would they trade for? There's, there's nothing really, maybe some fur pelts. But of course, if that same shipping vessel arrived at the port of, I don't know, what a big port city is. Uh, but anyway, they arrived at some port city in America today. And of course, there's no shortage of things to trade for. So it's important to understand really that when you buy and sell stuff, what you're doing is trading production. What happens to the economy is that we produce in order to consume. A farmer grows crops or raises animals to sell. Fisherman catches fish to sell and to exchange those fish for other stuff that they want. So the more stuff that you produce, the more stuff you can purchase. What happened during the Great Depression is actually much more different, much more complicated. So in 1913, the Federal Reserve was founded. This allowed for the conversion of the United States from a gold standard to a de facto paper money standard. Prior to the Federal Reserve, banks would issue banknotes, sort of like a private money that was backed by gold. But after the Federal Reserve was established, banknotes were now redeemable for Federal Reserve notes for paper. The the Federal Reserve notes, the 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 uh, currency, um, the U.S. dollar as it's known today, is uh, was redeemable for gold, but it was never really redeemed um, because Americans didn't go abroad that much. So this this enabled uh, in inflation of the currency, uh, printing money. So during the 1920s, banks, private banks, engaged in uh, widespread uh, artificial credit expansion. That is, they lent money out, money that they had created out of thin air, uh, they lent it out to businesses, which expanded the money supply by about 50%, $28 billion. At the same time, gold reserves only increased by $1 billion. So you had a large expanse of the money supply in the form of, of bank loans to businesses, but this wasn't backed by real consumer savings. It was just money that was created out of thin air, inflation, and lent out. So normally, in order to lend out money, that is without fractional reserve banking and fiat money, but with a gold standard, you need consumer savings. You need deposits that you can then lend out. See, if a, a bank were, were to lend out more than its deposits under under a full reserve or free banking system, what happens is, so the bank gets like $500 in gold or five, 500 ounces of gold, and then it issues bank notes. Uh, it, it makes loans on these for-profit loans, uh, interest-bearing loans, you know, to, to businesses, let's say, uh, with paper notes that, that are redeemable for gold. So then uh, the businessman takes the loan, goes to the hardware store, buys some stuff with the bank note. The hardware store guy goes to his bank, deposits the bank notes there. Of course, this, this, his bank doesn't want a, a note from another bank. What it wants is the gold. So they call upon the other bank for redemption of specie for, for the bank note for gold, because that's what the note says. It says, you know, bring this to the bank. We'll give you a certain amount of gold. So the other bank does that. And now if the first bank has been just lending out more than its reserves, they're caught with their pants down. They become insolvent and a bank run occurs. So the, the Federal Reserve System was basically an attempt to allow banks to engage in expansionary bank credit, lending out money that they created in thin air, uh, without this risk of redemption of specie, redemption uh, of gold. Because now they had the Federal Reserve notes that they would redeem them for, paper money. So the problem with this system of expansionary bank credit is 
that it it resembles an increase in consumer time preference. Okay, so what is time preference? Time preference is the degree to which you want something today versus tomorrow. So in a society where people have high savings, they, they've got a very low time preference. That is, they, they are more interested in saving for the future than they are in consuming today. In such a society, interest rates are pretty low because there's a large pool of loanable funds. There's a lot of people saving money and lending it out. Um, so, so artificial bank credit expansion mimics this large pool of loanable funds, and it it sends a signal to entrepreneurs to uh, direct resources towards capital goods industries, and that's what happened during the 1920s. All this artificial bank credit pushed investment to capital goods industries. Businesses were expanding, uh, business was booming, and while prices were relatively stable for consumers, you look at business price indexes, they were they were really taking off as as resources were being bid away from capital goods industries, away from pardon me, consumer goods industries towards capital goods industries. And what happened with the 29 crash was quite simply that the these malinvestments in capital goods industries were eventually found out to be uneconomic because they weren't reflective of consumer demand. So if producers are producing a bunch of stuff that people don't actually want, they're going to find out sooner or later. And, um, and then factors of pre production are going to get realigned along the basis of consumer demand as directed by the price system. So that caused the 29 crash and things got bad, but they weren't really that bad. You had sort of like modest unemployment. So normally recessions aren't really that bad. They're short lived. There's malinvestment. It gets cleared up. The recession is actually the healthy phase of the business cycle as factors of production are realigned along with the basis of consumer demand. There's a little, a little short-term pain, but it's usually not a big problem. Then something else happened, which was the passage of Smoot-Hawley. Smoot-Hawley was a tariff bill. Smoot-Hawley imposed really high tariffs on the import of foreign goods. This caused retaliatory tariffs to be established by other countries, and this had a devastating effect on the agricultural sector, which was almost entirely exports at the time, or very, very heavily uh, exporting. A lot of the food that was being produced in America at the time was sold overseas in other markets. So with the collapse of the agricultural sector, you then had the collapse of the rural banks. And now the depression was in full swing. And Hoover actually tried a lot of things to make to, to fix the problem, to alleviate the unemployment. But what he did was he tried to keep wages high. He believed, as does this YouTuber, that it was a problem of not enough demand. Uh, people weren't spending money, therefore money wasn't being spent. Nobody else had money because, you know. And, and that's the whole line of thought. The reality is that during a recession, prices need to fall, uh, wages especially. And if you try to keep wages at an artificially high level, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with an unsold surplus of labor. That is to say, high unemployment. And when unemployment is at 15, 20, 25 percent, that's a real problem. Now, if wages had been allowed to drop, everybody would have got back to work. And, yeah, they'd be working for a lower wage right now. But then, as everybody's working, they're all producing. And the economy gets right back on its feet. And wages go back up to where they were before. Because the economy is really just as productive as it always had been. It, you just had to realign stuff so it was 
more was producing the right stuff, the stuff that people wanted to buy. See, contra Marx, uh, wages do increase steadily, especially in a free market economy when you don't have uh, a lot of government and regulations and taxes and whatnot. For example, during the Gilded Age in America, wages rose faster than basically at any other time. You had gold standard, you had uh, very limited regulation, and you had a free market where the government wasn't intervening to pick winners and losers. That's a big problem uh, with what's called crony capitalism, where the government's constantly getting involved and deciding who wins and loses. That might benefit the cronies, but it comes at the expense of everybody else. So that's not a good thing. What you want is a free market where there's just open competition and no one business is favored by anybody else except consumers. That is, consumers have the ultimate choice in what's being produced and, and how it's which company they purchase from. So because of Hoover's experience here in the 1920s, when he saw the, the recession under Harding and he thought that the government should have intervened then, when he was in office, uh, he tried all sorts of things to uh, to keep wages up. He tried to keep farm prices up, you know, which is the last thing you should do when everybody's unemployed and hungry is increasing the cost of food. That's just inhumane. And everything he did made things worse because it prevented the economy from fixing itself. Uh, massive unemployment would mean wages go down and then everybody's employed, but that was prevented. They didn't want stores to lower prices, again, out of this mistaken belief that if you just keep spending up, the problem will fix itself. So that meant you had unsold surpluses of goods. The stores weren't doing well. Basically, everything was screwed up. Keynes's theory was significant because it was an expression of the bourgeois class coming to terms with the fact that capitalism had created a general crisis, a crisis of a magnitude that required a dramatic restructuring of the economy. It's not really the Marxist fault that they believe that industrial capitalism causes the business cycle, because industrial capitalism and the business cycle uh, also started at the same time. But so did the institution of central banking. So that caused a lot of confusion. People attribute the business cycle to the inner workings of capitalism. But in reality, it's about the money and about banking. And if you think about it, money is the only thing that touches all aspects of the economy. So the, the origin of the business cycle has to be from within money itself. FDR applied Keynes's ideas and similar ideas into policies that were highly favorable to the working class. In 19 That's not really true either, although most people would probably see it that way. But if you look at FDR's record while he was president, uh, unemployment was at or above 15% pretty much the whole time until 1940 when uh, America, uh, when World War II breaks out. So that's like eight years, which, by the way, is about as long as any other person has gotten to be president for, after you're in a third term for some reason. But, but during those eight years, America had chronic unemployment at a basically unimaginable level. And it's weird because FDR is lionized for how great he was on the economy when he literally presided over the worst economy America's ever had. I mean, 15, 20% unemployment for eight years is a really, really, really bad record. And it's so obvious that FDR's policies caused unemployment to be that high uh, because, like, nobody... No other president has ever had that happen. It's not like people are just going to stop working on their own. It, it's because he had, he had the policy of keeping wages high. And when you keep, this is, this is basic economics. This is so 
this is economics 101 is that you have supply and demand and quantity supplied and quantity demanded and there's an equilibrium price a market clearing price and if you have a price control like right like a price floor which is what the minimum wage is or or if you try to push prices above the equilibrium price then you're going to get an unsold surplus so this is this is just so basic economic fact that's been observed through through thousands of years since since the time of the romans governments have instituted price controls and the results have always been the same there was no different under fdr uh so his high wage policy led to this chronic and brutal unemployment the worst unemployment in any american president's record and yet supposedly he was good on the economy it's it's very perplexing another thing that fdr did was institute high taxes fdr instituted high sales taxes that really hurt the poor and the working class during fdr's tenure uh, or during the first four years sales taxes raised more revenue for the federal government than corporate and income taxes combined it's it's true that fdr was very pro-union but i think it, it, it's a mistake to equate being pro-union with being pro-worker when you look at the massive increase in taxes and the harm that did to the economy when you look at the widespread unemployment when you look at the effect of fdr's policies on conditions for ordinary workers when you look at the chilling effect that fdr's anti-business policies had on business investment and how that translated into a stagnating economy i think it's not at all accurate to say that fdr's policies were good for workers